Welcome to Virtual Assistant Launchpad, a free course designed to help you learn the basics of launching your own virtual assistant business. Whether you're just starting to explore becoming a virtual assistant or you've already launched your business and you need a little extra guidance, this course will provide you with a ton of value. We'll cover the essential steps to help you get your business off the ground. From defining your services and your target market to finding new clients, I'm going to walk you through everything that you need to know as a newbie. The content in this course is released in parts. Each day, you will get access to new content. And today we're going to kickstart things off by learning the basics of the business, like the different types of virtual assistants. Tomorrow, you'll get access to the next lecture in which we'll talk about defining your services. The third day, we will discuss rates. And on the fourth day, we'll talk about identifying your ideal clients. Now, every single day comes with an action item or a meaningful step that you can take in order to help get your business set up correctly. So if you're ready to take the first steps towards becoming a successful virtual assistant, let's get this party started. Before you can even start your VA business, there are a few things that we need to cover, like the different types of virtual assistants. And in today's lecture, we're also going to take a skills assessment. The purpose of today's activity is twofold. It's to help you define which types of assistant you might be. And it's also to prepare us for tomorrow's lessons in which you will be defining your core group of services. So let's start with the basics. What is virtual assistance? Virtual assistants, or VA for short, is a type of remote work where you as an individual are providing administrative, creative, maybe even technical support to clients from a remote location. Now, virtual assistants provide a huge and wide variety of tasks depending on uh, the needs of your clients, depending on your skills. It could be that you're managing emails and schedules, conducting research, creating or managing social media accounts, writing blogs, creating graphics, and so much more. A virtual assistants typically work as freelancers or independent contractors with clients all over the globe. And these two terms, freelance and contractor, by the way, are interchangeable. These terms essentially mean the same thing. And it means that when people or companies hire us, we are not considered full-time employees. We do not get certain employee benefits like health insurance. And we are responsible for doing things like paying our own taxes. Here's a pro tip, by the way. Even though virtual assistants are considered freelancers or independent contractors, I want you to start day one by thinking of yourself like a CEO. Because when you commit to launching a virtual assistant business, you are launching a business. And you are, in essence, your own CEO your own boss, your own founder of your new company. So if you want to take a little bit of a empowering pause, do so now and remind yourself that right now, day one, as you're launching your business, you're a badass CEO. So virtual assistance has become super popular in recent years. And I think it's because more and more businesses and entrepreneurs are like are recognizing the benefits of outsourcing projects to remote workers like us. It offers them flexibility. It offers cost savings. It gives them access to a global talent pool. Honestly, it's a win-win for virtual assistants like us and clients because it allows us a chance to work with interesting clients and meet interesting people that we might not otherwise have had a chance to meet. So let's dive a little bit deeper. The term virtual assistance is a very broad term. I like to think of the term virtual assistance like an umbrella, and there are lots of different types of assistants that fall under this umbrella term. There are typically two broad categories that you're going to fall into. On one hand, you can be a general virtual assistant, and a general VA is somebody who provides a wide range of administrative type tasks. So think executive assistant, think personal assistant, um, typically, these are things like managing emails and calendars, conducting research, doing data entry. Now, in contrast, a niche virtual assistant is someone who has specialized skills or knowledge in a particular area. A social media virtual assistant may specialize in managing social media accounts, creating content for social media platforms, an e-commerce virtual assistant, 
may specialize in managing online stores and order fulfillments. A bookkeeping virtual assistant may specialize in accounting and financial management. So hopefully you're starting to see the difference here. General VA, more broad scope, offering lots of different administrative type duties. And a specialized VA, while they do have the knowledge and the capability to offer those admin type tasks, also can offer a specialized subset, bookkeeper, e-commerce, social media, etc. Niche VAs, by the way, are typically able to charge higher rates because they come with a specialized set of skills. Something to keep in mind before we talk about rates on day three. And most people start their career as virtual assistants as a general VA. In fact, I did too. When I first launched my business in 2012, I really wasn't sure if I wanted to niche in anything at all. Many virtual assistants enjoy a long and successful career as general VAs for their entire career. I don't want you to feel any pressure to choose a more specialized niche if you don't feel particularly drawn to anything like bookkeeping or like managing social media accounts. Um, in fact, check out this epic tweet by one of my favorite freelancers, Stefan. I really could not have said this better myself, but it is definitely better to get started than to get hung up on what you may or may not want to specialize in on day one. So now that you have a few more details about the different types of virtual assistants, we're going to spend the next lecture uh, doing a skills assessment. Now this is a hands-on exercise that will help you start to gather your thoughts around which category you might fall into. This skills assessment is one of my most favorite exercises, and I even do my own assessments every so often just to see if I can add more services to my business offering. So this exercise is meant to be simple, fun, and quick. I want you to think of it like an epic brainstorm to help you design a business that's filled with services that you actually enjoy doing. Now, in the description of this lecture, you will find a downloadable PDF. You can choose to do the brainstorm on this PDF that I'm providing, or you can also grab a sheet of paper and a pen. I know, pen and paper is so analog, am I right? Either way, I'm going to walk you through this exercise. First, I want you to make a list of all the skills that you can possibly think of that you have. This can be a mix of hard skills. Hard skills are things like uh, languages that you speak, technical skills, like maybe you're really good at Adobe Photoshop. Maybe you've nailed Excel formulas. And I also want you to mix this in with some soft skills, like uh, if you have strong written communication skills or problem solving or time management skills. And I want you to draw inspiration from a lot of different areas in your life. Think about college days, uh, especially if you're a new graduate. First jobs that you had. Think about your previous job that you had, if any. Or if you've been a stay-at-home parent, there are so many hard and soft skills that you can apply to this brainstorm. Hit pause on this video now and spend the next few minutes getting all of those skills out of your brain and onto a piece of paper. Okay, great job. I hope that was fun. It was certainly intended to be. And next, I want you to ask yourself, of all the skills that you jotted down, can any of those be done remotely? If you have written any skills down that cannot be done remotely, I want you to cross those things out. This could be things like um, handwritten notes, scanning documents, accepting incoming calls on somebody's behalf, or even running on-site errands. If you have anything in that realm that just cannot be done remotely or cannot be done on your client's behalf, go ahead and cross those things out. So pause the video now. Just take a few seconds. If there's anything that can't be done remotely, exit off. Okay, your third step. Look at the skills that you've written down. And I want you to ask yourself, which of those do you enjoy doing and or are you passionate about? You have the golden opportunity to build a business that you actually like. So why would you offer services that you just hate doing? So if you've included any skills that you absolutely dread doing, cross those off your brainstorm list. I'll give you an example. I really truly hate creating social media content for my clients' social channels. I find 
creating content for other people to be tedious, time consuming, stressful. I don't enjoy it. It makes me not look forward to my day. So I no longer offer social media management to my clients. So you know what's coming. Pause this video. If there's anything you hate to do, maybe it's bookkeeping, maybe it's blog writing, maybe it's, I don't know, travel booking, whatever it is that you don't enjoy doing or you find stressful, go ahead and cross that off your list now. And when you're done crossing that off, hit play, join me in the next step. All right, this last step takes a little bit of creativity. So last thing that we're going to do is we're going to prioritize the remaining skills using your level of expertise, your passion, and the market demand. I know I'm throwing a lot at you. Let's pretend, for example, that one of your skills you've written down is typing. Maybe you're a really fast typist and you're really proficient about typing documents quickly. While that's super cool that you are great at typing quickly and accurately, and you'd probably kick my butt if we went head to head, this isn't necessarily an in-demand skill that clients are willing to pay for. And that's because I don't think clients necessarily care how fast you can type. So do go through and if you've highlighted anything that you're like, okay, I, I can do X, Y, Z, but I don't know that clients would pay for it. Go ahead and cross that out. On the flip side, maybe you've identified that one of your skills is that you can find anybody's email address anywhere, anytime. Like if you are FBI level good at researching and finding people's contacts. That is a truly crucial skill that people are willing to pay for because that falls under lead generation. If you can find leads for your clients to reach out to, that's a desirable skill. All right, hopefully at the end of this full exercise, you're left with a handful of skills that you enjoy working on, have some experience in, and hopefully are in demand and clients are willing to pay for. If you've gone through this whole list and you're feeling a little dissatisfied about the brainstorm, I don't want you to be crushed <laughs> or, or, or let that deflate your momentum. The thing about the skills assessment is that this is just a first step, an early brainstorm to get your juices flowing. This is your first opportunity to start thinking about things that you enjoy doing, uh, to think about things that maybe you could offer for your business. So if you're struggling to come up with something or you're feeling a little dissatisfied, do the exercise again and don't be so hard on yourself or so critical. You guys did a great Welcome back to day two. We're talking all about skills and services. And before you can even really start your business, you definitely need to know what services you're going to offer as well as what services you absolutely will not be offering. So first things first, pull up your skills assessment brainstorm that we did together yesterday. I want you to look at the list of skills that you've generated and identify the ones that you are particularly good at or passionate about. Are there any skills on your list that make you excited? Are there any skills that you could talk about for hours without any preparation? When I first did my skills assessment, uh, one of my favorite skills that I highlighted was international travel. I could talk about travel hacking every day, all day, so I knew that corporate travel was something that I wanted to offer my clients as part of my core services. And thanks to my marketing positioning about being a VA who focused on corporate and luxury travel, I landed a client who I'm still with today, almost six years later, and all I do for them is corporate travel. Pause this video. Your first step is to see if you've highlighted anything from your skills assessment that you love to talk about, you're passionate about, you're good at, and it gets you jazzed in the morning. And you would be jazzed to wake up and work with or on this skill every day. Now, based on the core skills that you're workshopping right now, you'll kind of have a better sense for what type of virtual assistant you are. So for example, if you've identified that you have skills in digital organization, you are great at filing things away, you're super organized, you have great time management, great scheduling, you might want to consider positioning yourself as a general virtual assistant. Alternatively, if you've identified that you have strong writing skills and you love long form writing, you might want to consider establishing yourself as a virtual assistant 
who specializes in blogging or content creation. Your decisions that you make today will also start to inform you about the types of clients you might want to work with. I am of the mindset that every CEO, middle manager, director, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, can benefit from having a virtual assistant because we are the person that makes all the admin uh, cogs turn in the background. But also, if you've identified that you're a fantastic writer, that might put you on a completely different trajectory. You might decide to try to market yourselves to coaches or entrepreneurs who have a product or a service that they sell because you could be the person that writes their sales marketing material. Also, I just want to reiterate that if you want to start your business as a general virtual assistant who offers administrative duties, uh, that doesn't mean that you will be a general VA forever. Over the years, you might find that you naturally gravitate towards a specific niche, or you might pick up new specialized skills and decide that you want to take your business in that direction. The beauty of being your own business owner is that nothing is set in stone and you can add or remove services based on your level of interest uh, and or the skills that clients are willing to pay for. So I want you to just take a breath. If you're feeling stressed right now, I got you. This is merely meant to help you start to plan out the basics of your business. So don't feel like what you commit to today is what you have to commit to for the next 10 years. In the next lecture, we're going to talk briefly about skills that you are absolutely not going to offer and why it's so important that you define those two. So while it's super important to focus on the skills that you do offer, it is actually equally important to focus on the skills that you will absolutely never offer in your business. As a virtual assistant, your time and your resources are limited. You want to make the most of your time in your business because you are just one person running your business. Now, by identifying the services that you don't offer, you can actually avoid wasting time on either tasks that you're not skilled at or tasks that are not aligned with your strengths or interests. And not only that, but it helps to repel clients who are just a bad fit for you. Relatedly, uh, it's very important to manage your clients' expectations about being really clear about what you do and don't do. Um, this, by the way, is typically called scope. By defining your scope of services or the services that you do or don't offer, you can actually avoid taking on tasks that are outside of your expertise or that you're not comfortable with, which helps to prevent client misunderstandings and conflicts. It's very easy for clients to assume that we virtual assistants are renaissance people, that we're able and willing to do anything that they assign to us. But this can lead to a lot of confusion and a lot of anger if you're suddenly turning down every task that they assign to you. The last thing you want is for your client to ask themselves, why in the world did I hire this virtual assistant in the first place if they just keep shooting down my task requests? Welcome back to day three. Hope you guys are excited about today, as excited as I am, because we are talking about setting rates. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. Setting rates is actually one of the most notoriously difficult things to do as a freelancer. And that's a variety of factors that we're going to talk about today. Price yourself too high, you run the risk of losing business because you're so high that clients are like, well, I'll just go ask another virtual assistant. On the flip side, unfortunately, the reverse is true too. If you price yourself too low, the client still runs the risk of taking their business elsewhere because they might be asking themselves, well, why is this VA so much lower than everyone else? What's wrong? So let's just dig into a couple of these variables. And I want you to just keep in your mind as we're going through today's video that all of these variables are going to be unique and different to you. So how we're going to present this today is we're going to go through different variables to think of. I'm also going to tell you a story about my rates and how they've changed over the years. And I'm going to tell you a story about a recent student of mine who lives in Vietnam and how he changed his rates as well. This lecture also comes with a worksheet to supplement some of what I'm about to tell you on video. So follow along if you'd like. The first step in thinking through your rates is to research industry trends. This first step also is very action oriented. So your action step is to Get online, go to websites like Fiverr, go to Google, type in virtual assistants and look for other VAs who do similar services as you. So if you in the past few days have identified that you are a general VA, look for other administrative assistants online who are also advertising similar calendar inbox travel management, etc. 
If you have identified that you're a more specialized virtual assistant, find somebody who specializes and also offers similar types of services. Aggregator sites like Fiverr.com are interesting in that you can filter different variables like where people live, uh, the ratings, the amount of years people have, and you can kind of get a sense for what ballpark figure people are charging per hour. And once you start to get a better idea about what the market trends are, what other virtual assistants in your niche or in your area are charging, you'll also need to consider your livable wage. What you need to do is take a rough estimate of your expenses that you have every month. These are things like your car insurance, your car note, gas, uh, rent, mortgage, food, childcare, healthcare, whatever it is that you are paying for regularly. I want you to jot it down on a list and make sure, you know, this can be a rough estimate, but just make sure that you have a general number per month that you need to hit. And then what we need to do is ask ourselves, if I'm charging $5 an hour and I am working 40 hours a month, does this pay my bills? If I'm charging $10 an hour, does this pay my bills? 20, 30, 40, et cetera, et cetera. Because ultimately, if you are in a city with high expenses, I'm just going to throw out an example, New York City, high expensive city, and you're a new VA and you're like, I think I'm going to price myself at $15 an hour. And the first few months land one to two clients. Let's say you're only working or charging 20 hours a month, $15 an hour times 20 hours a month. You're only making $300 a month. That's not livable. That's not even enough to pay for groceries. So these rates will really help you determine, you know, does my hourly rate need to increase to 30, 35? Or do I need to find more clients? I don't want to scare you with that very low $300 scenario that I just threw out there. So let's talk about more realistic rates. I'm going to start by telling you a story about myself. I started as a virtual assistant in 2012. I started charging $20 an hour. That was my starting rate living in the United States. By the end of my first year of business, I was making an annual rate of about $30,000 a year. Now, 10 years ago as a much younger person with cheaper rent, uh, that was okay. It was enough for me to break even, if not make a little bit of profit. So that $20 an hour made sense for me back then. Over the years, however, a lot of things have changed. My level of expertise in how fast I can get work turned around changed. The world changed within those 10 years. Inflation went up. My expenses increased. My rent got more expensive. At some point in my career, I bumped all my general virtual assistant services up to $35 an hour. Whatever rate you're setting for yourself right now, it's not set in stone. Okay, if you come to a rate that you're like, well, okay, I live in America and, uh, you know, my, my expenses, I split them with a spouse, so maybe I can start at the $25 an hour rate and we'll see how that goes. If that's working for you and you're landing clients at that rate, that's fantastic. You're not going to be at that rate forever. Now, I have a, a, a second story for you, and this is a student that I coached one-on-one -on -one recently who lives in Vietnam, and he came to me with a fantastic set of skills. He was a niche virtual assistant in that he could do video editing and social media management for his clients. So, uh, oh, he was also bilingual. So he started um, at $5 an hour with this company years ago, and he realized rightly so very quickly that other assistants in America were making more money. And so he raised his rates to $10 an hour. And when he came to me, he was uh, trying to raise his rates again, but his American client was giving him a hard time. I suggested to him that if you are working with a client who's having a hard time meeting you at your rate, rather than giving a discount, especially if you're coming to the table with a lot of great services, I want you to negotiate. A negotiation is really ultimately just a conversation to find a workable solution where you and your client are happy. So I told him, hey, if your client isn't willing to go from 10 to 15 today, what if you suggest a $1 increase per month over the next five months? Long story short, the client agreed. So there are ways that you can negotiate, you can get creative. So hopefully this lecture gives you a little bit of thinking 
with how you can present your rates. Tomorrow is my favorite day, day four, in which we're talking about clients. We're going to discuss the types of people that you want to work with versus the types of people that you don't want to work with. And of course, we are going to be using your skills assessment and your core offerings page to help us kind of plan out this portion as well. So you guys did a great job today. Get some rest and I will see you tomorrow when we talk about clients. Day four, it's the last day. Should we have a little graduation party for you guys? All right, so welcome back to day four where we are discussing clients, who you want to work with, who you don't want to work with, how to talk to them. Um, and we will be using these sheets about your core offerings and your skills to help us inform the types of clients that you may or may not want to work with. And yes, today's lecture comes with a PDF to help you plan out who your clients are and where your ideal clients might hang out online. So be sure to download that right now. Think about the industries and businesses that require the skills that you have to offer. But let's say you have identified that you have strong social media skills and you're passionate about health and wellness trends. You, based on that detail, might want to target health and wellness businesses that have a limited or underutilized social media presence. Do your clients need to be in a particular time zone? Now, we VAs can work with clients anywhere in the world, so you can actually design a life that fits around your schedule and your ideal schedule. I do not like waking up in the morning and heading right into work. So I purposely keep all of my clients in the same time zone that's three hours behind me because by working with clients in a different time zone, this gives me enough flexibility to have my mornings completely open and then work a little bit, a little bit later into the evening. Now, conversely, you might have young kids at home, uh, or maybe you just want or need to have your evenings free, in which case you might want to target people or businesses that are a few hours ahead of you, meaning you would work earlier in the morning hours and you will wrap up work early afternoon, which allows you time to spend time with your family or run errands in the afternoon, et cetera, et cetera. Something I caution you about, and just as this some food for thought, is that I do have a good friend who's a VA who, um, she's based in the UK. She has American clients, clients in the UK, and clients in Asia. And what that means for her is she typically ends up working over 12 hours a day because she is working around the clock to make sure that she is online and answering emails across half of a world of time zones. So personally, that works for her, and she's very happy with it because she enjoys working. She gets up early, she goes to bed late, she likes it. And for me, that wouldn't work. I would wither away to dust if I had to work that many hours every day or had to be sure that I was online for lots of different clients. So that is something to be mindful of. Now, as you're filling this sheet out, by the way, I don't want you to feel like, again, this is set in stone. It's not. This is a brainstorm, especially when you're new. It's important that you have a sense of direction for the types of people that you might want to try to target online, but by no means is this the only thing that you have to follow when you're starting your business. So let's use that same example about the health and wellness industry. If you've, you're really passionate about this industry, you're well-versed in health and wellness, it's like a passion of yours, you work out all the time. Uh, if you think, oh, okay, I maybe would like to work with health coaches or nutritionists, and you start to research these people online and find that, you know what, maybe you either are having a hard time connecting with them or they're not actually looking for virtual assistance or you find that, you know what, this is more of a personal hobby, not a work thing. That's okay. Again, this is not set in stone. It is simply meant to be a compass, so to speak, to help point you in the right direction. So do make sure that you're taking some time to fill this sheet out today. Uh, just so that we can use it for the next sections. Where do your clients hang out? I love this question because, again, all the answers will be unique to you. But if you've done all of the action items thus so far, and let's say, for example, you've identified that you want to work with a CEO at a tech startup in San Francisco, you're like, you know what? I love that startups are new every day and it's chaos and I want to work with a small company, maybe one to two people, and I want a young go get em CEO, where might this person, this imaginary person, spend their time online? I can tell you that they're probably not spending their free time on Snapchat or Instagram or Facebook. They might, however, spend their free time posting on LinkedIn. And that's because LinkedIn tends to cater to business owners, so it would make sense 
that a startup CEO is sharing key takeaways on LinkedIn or networking with other people on LinkedIn or raising money on LinkedIn. Conversely, if you have identified that you really want to be a virtual assistant to freelance writers, where might a freelance writer hang out online? They're probably not on Snapchat. Stop (laughs) talk. They're probably not on Snapchat. They're probably not hanging out on TikTok, but they might be hanging out and spending their free time on Twitter. That's because a lot of writers have a big community on Twitter. There are things like Twitter chats for writers specifically, especially freelance writers, where they're tweeting their thoughts on the industry and where they can find work. So that might be a place where you start to search for these people. What if you identified that you actually want to work with companies who sell physical products? Maybe you're like, I am a totally an e-commerce virtual assistant and I want to help people sell things. Now, these clients probably are hanging out on platforms like Instagram, like TikTok, because they sell a very visual product. They're probably doing direct-to-consumer sales through things like Instagram. And so you might want to be on Instagram. My point is... As you start to think about the types of people that you're interested in working with, you need to know where to connect with those people, where they spend most of their free time. Because if you decide to specialize in corporate travel and you're posting really pretty pictures with airplanes on Instagram, there's a huge mismatch there. And that's because the chances that the corporate traveler, who is usually the COO or a president of a company, they're probably not spending a lot of time on Instagram. But if you instead talk about your travel services on LinkedIn and you're using hashtags about CEOs, CEO life, corporate life, corporate travel, you have a much better chance of connecting with the CEO who wants to offload booking. Now, even though this is day four, I have one more video coming for you guys tomorrow. So be on the lookout for one more video from me tomorrow. Congratulations, guys. You completed the Launchpad course in just four days. The purpose of this free course was to give you the essentials for your business, identifying your skills, your interests, the services you can offer, who your ideal clients might be, and where you might find them online. And if you completed all of these action items this week, you are off to a great start because fleshing out the business is the most crucial step before you can even start talking to potential clients. And you might be asking yourself, what's next? I'm ready to take this to the next level. I have created a brand new membership site that continuously builds your business to ensure that you are running a profitable business from day one. How it works is every month, I will focus on a new topic. During those four weeks, I will share exclusive video content that you will not be able to find anywhere else. I will share templates, scripts, downloadables so that you can spend less time building and more time doing. I will share exclusive interviews with experts in their fields to ensure that you are getting the most up-to-date information. In fact, in the first few months of the membership, you will get an exclusive interview with a digital marketing strategist, as well as a pricing and negotiation specialist. Perhaps my favorite part, you will have real opportunities to pitch real clients. Anytime clients approach me looking for a VA, I pass along their details to you, giving you the opportunity to decide if this is a person you want to try to work with, that's your chance to pitch them. The price I'm sending is $27 a month, but because you guys have done my introductory course, I'm giving you the option to sign up for the first month at a 50% discount. So for the first month, you'll only pay $13. Now, if you're mentally crunching numbers right now, this membership is less than $1 per day, but the benefits are priceless. You get skills and business growth and the opportunity to pitch real clients. This is the kind of stuff that you will only get in VA Insiders. Now, whether you guys join me in the membership club or not, I really hope that you guys found some value out of this course. I truly wish you nothing short of success in your business, and I can't wait to see where you go from here.